So hello everybody. Welcome to Art Salon. Art Salon meets twice a month, first and third Tuesdays of every month. And I invite a different artist to present their work each time. Sometimes we do things that are more practical. A few weeks ago, we did something about social media, which was more of a hands-on promoting ourselves as artists and learning some skills. Most of the time, I'm inviting an artist who I think is really exciting and has something important to share about their process and their inspirations and how their work has developed. Orlando is someone that I'm thrilled to present tonight. Orlando Chiang is a sculptor who was born in Chile. And I don't yet know when he came to the United States, but he's been here for quite some time. He's got a Chinese Chilean background with a grafting on of American. And he's a physical therapist who has studied armature and sculpture and the body and has turned that into sculpture in ways that are fascinating. And so it's my pleasure to introduce Orlando Chiang. Good evening, everybody. I want to thank Ellie for this opportunity. It's an honor to be here. In this room, there are so many artists, friends that I really respect very much. So thank you for coming. To understand a little bit my art, I had to go back a little bit to my background. Ellie started a little bit in some way. I was born in Chile, in the north part of Chile, that's the uh, Atacama Desert. These colors uh, stay with me all the times, especially whenever I'm working with some metals, in particular with uh, copper. This area is where 80% of the copper production in the world is coming from. And it's my uh, material of choice. I have uh, some emotional tie with the uh, copper. My first job, summer job, when I was 14, 15 year old, was in a copper mine, over mine, and I was able to see the process. This is my town. My parents were Chinese. I was born in Chile. Very supportive parents regarding art. When I was about 10 years old, I decided to take a night class, and that was metal repoussé with copper. But they always encouraged me to practice any art. I went to Catholic school. Right now, I practice Buddhism. And um, I'm also a physical therapist by profession, and I moved to the state back in 91. And in um, 92, 93, after coming from a huge depression, I decided that I needed to do something for me. And uh, I said, why not art classes? It's interesting, when I was in high school, I wasn't the best art student. I wasn't good on drawing, or I wasn't good on painting. Understanding the painting that it had to be very flat, you know, very aligned, and the drawing had to be very kind of uh, <coughs> picture perfect. So I always consider myself that um, I didn't have any art skill at all, yeah. But on the other hand, in Chile, uh, there's a parallel class in school. It's called manual art, and um, I really enjoy it. But to me, that wasn't art. After coming from that depression, I decided to do something challenging for me, and uh, that was art. And I started coming to the armory, and I started with drawing, painting for a big while. Then eight years ago, I decided to try something different, and I came to start practicing sculpting, trying to learn the different medias, clay, metal, 
stone, wood, malt making, wax, this is metal, pewter, and non-traditional materials also, this is PVC. So all my um, academia from art, I would say that is coming from the Armory Art Center. The title of this uh, presentation is Sculpting the Mind. And I decided to divide it in two segments. One is my mind observing the outside world. And I represent it with this piece. As an artist, we are always looking for the magical moment. Sometimes we are in an ordinary life, but all of a sudden something got our attention. And that happened to me with, uh, with the tree. I was working with a model without any agenda, and then I uh, went to get some lunch when all of a sudden I saw the shape of the form that you know, the, the, the posture that she was giving me to work on, it was so similar. But tree, coming from my main language, Spanish, tree is a masculine element, el árbol. But then when I was looking at the tree and I saw so many leaves, a big shadow, and so much protection, and I started to look at the feminine qualities of the tree, and then took me to the whole uh, pollinization process, which is very feminine. So I felt very attracted with the feminine inside of the tree. And that's how I come out with uh, this piece, La Natura. I made it in clay, and this was cast in fiberglass. A sculpture to me, sometimes it can be very static in some way. And that's why I felt so compelled to add some natural elements in there, like a natural branch. In that way, the sculpture is going to be moving with you with the time. We will be able to see the leaf coming down. And when the new season comes, we can change the branches. So it's moving with us. Working as a physical therapist, I feel very lucky in many ways. First, I support my art. <laughs> and uh, on the other hand, it gives me the opportunity to keep my um, artistic fiber sensitive, especially working with people that they are suffering or having some problems. It made me more sensitive to the human nature. And, that's how I created this piece. I wanted to represent the loneliness that a person who is sick can have in many ways. So that's why the platform got the long legs. I got that, that, that feeling, the feeling of loneliness, isolation. Hmm? I wanted to leave also some open spaces to show the vulnerability of the human body, how weak we can be in some way, or strong in another. This piece was made of a pewter. I have the best t-shirt that I could have in this material, <laughs> and he's here now. Joe has been a, a very excellent teacher to me, and uh, a good friend. I really felt to, to do that, you know, to feel, to show the, the holes. So the metal was poured on purpose on some area in much thinner way. I wasn't sure when I was putting together because it was a pain in the neck to, uh, to put the pieces together and with the different temperatures and uh, uh, it, it was uh, quite a work. Uh, it was 
a cast on silicon because the silicon can have the hold the temperature of the melt pewter. Yeah, and because of the twisted position, the mold had to be cut in pieces, in different pieces. Uh -huh. This piece came across after I read an article that most of the psycho-emotional problems it come from the uh, relationship mother-children, especially more um, mother-daughter, and how uh, that relationship determined the uh, psychological well-being of the daughter. And I felt that, uh, you know, there's a, a change on the mother image from a, a sacrificed person to a crucified person. And I was wondering when that happened, when that changed. Huh? And the dynamic of that relationship, it was uh, very compelling to me. Um, I don't know why I, I feel that uh, blue it represents uh, wisdom to me. So that's why um, the face is blue. This piece, <laughs> this piece is about a stereotype. It's a girl, it's a boy. Huh? What it is? Something that a stereotype, it comes from even before we were born. Well, as soon as our parents know, uh, you know, if we're going to be a boy or girl, they start painting the room blue or pink. Uh, we have a, like a gender color code. And to me, that's the beginning of many things because from the color code, we go to the toys. What kind of toys, you know, we're going to play with? Uh, toys for boys, toys for girls. And book, what kind of book we're going to read? What kind of profession we're going to have? What kind of um, roles we're going to have at home and at work? And to me, it comes, is there, everything started with the whole division of gender between men and women. I was reading yesterday, you know, that we're still debating if women should get paid in the same <laughs> wage that they are. Yeah, so that piece is about that and how society domesticates you on how you are going to behave in life. In the personal level, this is one of the pieces that I, I feel very bonded in many ways. When I was working on it, to me it was going to therapy. <laughs> for long session of therapy. Because as a gay man, I, w I grew up with that issue. You know, what is a uh, boy supposed to do? And you know, oh no, it's too girly or whatever. And especially coming from uh, Latin culture, you know, boys, um, boys don't cry. Yeah. When I was doing this piece, I was able to grip my dad and cry for the first time. I'm coming from a family that I have just four sisters, my mom. So when my dad died, everybody was saying, you are the boy, you don't have to cry. You cannot cry. Those kind of feelings could come out when, when I was working on this. Yeah. The face is supposed to be me, too. <laughs> when I was working, I was trying to do a self-portrait, and then when this feeling started coming, I went back and tried to make it younger and younger look. There's so many details in this face because I was trying to achieve the androgynous part. So on one side, it, it can be girl, on the other side, it can be boy. A few years ago, I felt so attracted to sex, how sex is so important in our society, how sex in some way is the source of anxiety and confusion, but on the other hand, it can be a source of pleasure or in intimacy.
So I started developing different work, and this was very interesting. This piece is my first sculpture that I did, and um, this is, uh, a sculpture is very important because it determined to me that um, I wanted to do something with a message behind. It happened that when I was working with a model and the model was talking about his life and how he wasn't looking for a relationship at all. So the more that he was talking, I felt so compelled to make the platform bigger and, and to make the platform a uh, part of the uh, sculpture because to me, that person is unable to move. Uh, this sculpture was done in concrete because of that feeling too. With concrete, whenever you put concrete, it's because you want to stand something and hold it there in one place. Uh -huh. Funny thing is that people were asking me why you didn't continue up there? And I was, my answer was, there's nothing up there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> there was nothing up there. Uh -huh. <laughs> I won the first prize with this sculpture, and it was my first one, and it was very motivating to continue doing this. Uh, what we do for love? <laughs> uh, what we do for love? It's, yeah, and explore the same relationship, the same dynamic, you know, about love and, and sex. When I was doing this piece, and during the first show, somebody told me the feminists won't be liking this piece at all. <laughs> <laughs> and my answer was, depend. If you look at the detail, you probably got different opinion. The title is in question mark. And if you notice the, the position of the, the feet, she's on charge. She's not in a submissive way, you know, with the toes pointing in. Uh -huh. Funny thing is that I wanted to exaggerate with the shoes. I wanted to exaggerate with the high. But um, I went to a party the other day and I saw somebody <laughs> wearing even higher than my shoes. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <weird>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The size of the shoes. The same model that I worked with the tree, I took the measurement for the corset and she loaned me one of the sh her shoes. So he got a. Uh, <laughs> the corset was made of bronze. Um, I wanted to recreate the feeling of lacy. Finally, I decided to do it with uh, inspired on the uh, Russian filigree. What I like from this piece is go from Black uh, work, you know, bending the, the big metal to a fine details, kind of jewelry detail. This is also metal, the lace. I wanted to relax a little bit <laughs> and do something funny. And this was so inspired on all the silicone work and the Viagra and uh, advertisement uh, that made you wondering uh, why, uh, why? Uh, actually, it, it was funny because the other day I was reading that the uh, sale of Vi Viagra is going down because now people are going to treatment for low T instead. <laughs> low T. Low testosterone. <laughs> I guess it's working. I guess. No, no, well, interesting thing was because people started realizing that Viagra, they were not making them happy. Huh? Just the other side. That was done on wood and pewter. With all the sex going on, what's happened with our animal inside? 
this is the very raw energy that we have inside and that sometimes determine our behavior. We act in some way. Um, in this case, you know, whenever you are about to do something, something comes up and say, wait a minute, I cannot do that. <laughs> uh, I'm committed to, this is not right. Uh -huh. So this piece is about that, is how we hold the beast inside us, the animal part of us. On this piece, I wanted to leave everything raw. The clay is without any treatment, the metal is without any treatment, the wood is nothing there, just the color was done with, uh, by burning a little bit the, the wood, because it's the same. Uh, it's so instant, it's so raw, it's so animal feeling. Few years ago, I got the opportunity to start practicing meditation. The big difference was that instead of observing the outside world, I went inside. By practicing meditation, I'm able to check my own mind, what's going on inside myself. And that's how, how it comes to these pieces. By practicing that, it made me go first to who I am, where I'm coming from, you know, and go back to my basic part. And I noticed that, and I explained it a little bit at the beginning of the introduction, there's so many influences on my life that is represented by these pieces. You know, there's so many places where you were born, the kind of education, your political belief, your religious belief, so many things that support myself. After looking at myself, you start comparing yourself with the other people, who I am and who are the other people. And the more that I see, the more similarities that I find myself with everybody in this room. It doesn't take too long to notice that we are so similar, just, just a skin deep, but then in the structural way, we are the same. We have the same blood, the same bones, the same structure, the same basic goodness. Cool bodies, where are you going? It's how I want to live my life. What path I'm going to follow? To me, it's a kind of question that is very important to question myself once in a while. The way that I live, <laughs> I said at one point that the outside world can be magic, but sometimes also the uh, outside world can be very provocative in many ways. As soon as we leave the house, we're exposed to so many things, so many emotions and feelings, dealing with work, dealing with anger, dealing with rushing out, and so many things. The weather, mosquito outside. So that it makes us live in some way with a lot of fear. And when we are living with fear, I feel more comfortable inside. <laughs> 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 yeah, and observe the world outside. I prefer to watch sometimes the nature show on TV rather than to be in the nature. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> this was made of PVC because I noticed that most of the time my fear are not real. I created by me. I create my own fear. And sometimes fear made me feel that they are real, but they are not. Uh, I'm going inside because I want to, but I can live if I want to. Impermanence. Impermanence, um, when I started practicing Buddhism, is a term that I fell in love with. 
and in so many ways I felt so attracted because it changed a little bit my uh, uh, belief. Being grown up, raised Catholic, I was dealing all the time between heaven and hell, <laughs> uh, which is, uh, it creates a lot of anxiety on uh, dying. Uh, where I'm going to go after I'm dying. Yeah. We don't have too much of the opportunity to see the, the leaf falling here in Florida, but uh, I had the opportunity to go to uh, Atlanta during the fall, and one day I was sitting in the patio and I saw the leaf falling out of the tree, and the way that it was going down, I saw that it was so beautiful, so... It was like a dance that for the first time I saw that dying can be beautiful too, uh, depending how we see this. At the same time, a good friend of mine was dying. With this friend, for the first time in my life, I was able to talk about dying in a very calm situation without the anxiety. When I was working on this piece, I had this friend of mine the whole time. I was so inspired with this. At the beginning, the idea was to make a, a bed of leaves on the floor and put the branch on top. But then whenever I uh, start talking with the people about you know, the loved one, they're already gone, nobody looks down. Everybody looks up. <laughs> huh? Yeah, no matter how the person was, but everybody was looking up, yeah. And also, I wanted to make a statement that all the leaves go to heaven. <laughs> it's something that, you know, it, it took me a big while to realize that, that all the leaves go to heaven. Copper sheet, the leaves? Copper, yeah, copper. I was telling you that I feel very emotional with the copper uh, as a metal in... I noticed that by working, just by heating it up, the copper, the colors that you can see there are the, the, the color of the sunset uh, in the desert of Chile. So uh, I like it. In your studio, when you were conceiving and, and first assembling this piece, were you very meticulous about where you wanted to place the lights and, and how you wanted the piece to, to look exactly? Or were you more happy with the somewhat random effects that you would get in the actual installation and in the gallery? Yeah, both, both. Uh, uh, first, um, the space was very big, and I was getting some anxiety about the, uh, how many leaves I needed. I was uh, installing the leaves for four days, full days, and over there there's about uh, 300, and I made like uh, 600. <laughs> yeah. So but I, I didn't have the time to put it all together. Huh? Whenever you hang the stuff, you try to hide the materials that you're hanging in there. But in this case, I like it. <laughs> it was a, a nice surprise because it looks like a rain. Uh -huh. If you notice that at the beginning, my work were very figurative. The, the figure was present in every single piece. But then when I started preparing my show with the installation, the idea was that uh, people would be part of the sculpture. I want the spectator to be part of. And it's very well represented by this picture. Somebody posted for me on, on Facebook. Yeah. In permanence, I felt uh, that I needed to do it in metal to represent all of our struggle to live longer, to stay younger longer, but it's a matter of time. At the end, even metal will die. Uh, the nest objects in, in that, that piece and the other that you showed earlier, it, were those steam formed from square dowling or was it more complex? The, the, the steam wood bend it. No, there were the small pieces, so I was able to twist it, bend it, and hold it in that position. So yeah. in, in essence, it's woven together. It would, it, if you took something out, it might spring apart. So has that amount of tension in the wood? I wanted to create that. 
uh, at the beginning, um, yeah, for a couple of days, I was watching videos of uh, how the bird built the, the nest. Yeah, uh, that was the original idea to uh, entwine the, the wood. I had two pieces of that, and when I was finishing that, then all of a sudden we one and everything went apart. <laughs> right on the side, bah, yeah. So then I had to just to put some glue in between. So, so those were all under tension. That's what the, you didn't steam form them at all to get the curve. Yeah, it was a steam and form oh. and twist to create the form. Gotcha. Yeah. Also on that piece uh, that, you, that you just showed in the middle that had the, the, the fairly small number of, of, of thick bamboo. What is the, the, the decorative middle sections in var at various heights? What, how was that done? What is that? How was done? It was chicken wire, the whole roll of chicken wire on a wet slip. The whole show was about life. Since we were born, you know, the definition of our ego, the way that we live until we die. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for your honesty and for sharing so much of your personal journey. I, I don't know too many artists who have gone as deep into their own personal experience and made it so universal in such inventive and marvelous ways. Thank you, I think, from all. Thank you. Thank you.